May the Spirit be with us this evening, and I appreciate the opening prayer, inviting the Spirit to attend to you and to me in this few moments of gospel teaching and discussion. In 1966, President Kimball wrote a talk entitled Tragedy and Destiny, which has been a, a talk which has helped me a number of times through my life. He said in that talk, we knew before we were born that we were coming to earth for bodies and experience, that we would have joys and sorrows, pain and comforts, ease and hardships, health and sickness, successes and disappointments, and we knew also that we would die. We accepted all these eventualities with a glad heart, eager to accept both the favorable and the unfavorable. We're in a, we are undoubtedly willing to have a mortal body, even if it were deformed. We eagerly accepted the chance to come earthward, even though it might be for a day, a year, or a century. Perhaps we were not so much concerned whether we should die of disease or accident or senility. We were willing to come and take life as it came, that we might organize and control it, and this without murmur, complaint, or unreasonable demands. We sometimes think we would like to know what is ahead, but sober thought brings us back to accepting life a day at a time and magnify and glorifying that day. He went on to say in that same article, I am positive in my mind that the word has planned that the world will have planned and it will be part of our destiny. We can shorten our lives, but I don't think we can lengthen them very much. Sometimes we will understand fully, and when we see back through the vantage point of the future, we shall be satisfied with many of the happenings of this life which seem so difficult for us to comprehend. I'd like to go back ten years in my life. I was left to ponder these very ideas in a stark, white, sterile environment of a hospital room. My dear wife Mary had been wheeled away to have an operation. My first response was to pr pray for her to be returned alive and well. In fact, it was almost a prayer of demand for her return because of her good life and how she had lived and the need for her husband and children to have her love and her care. And that in that same way, because of the service by both she and her husband, that it was something which was owed to us. Upon concluding the first prayer, a heavy feeling lay on me. There was not a feeling of comfort and peace, reassurance that I had anticipated. What was wrong? What hadn't I done to be comforted? What did I still have so much fear for? Why was I not in a state of feeling peace? After a few minutes of apprehension and deliberation, I knelt to pray again for a second time. This time, however, my prayer was one of acknowledging the Lord's hand in our lives and giving thanks for the many blessings we had received as companions for twenty years, and expressing that I would accept the outcome of the operation to be in God's hands and that His will would be done. After concluding the prayer, I was ready to accept the will of God as it affected Mary's life and mine. At the conclusion of the prayer, a sweet, comforting spirit of peace rested upon me, not because I was assured of Mary's safe return and her health, but because of the assurance that I had accepted my Father's will and the trust in Heavenly Father and in His Son, Jesus Christ, to be given the strength to meet the trials of this particular mortal test. After a few more minutes of reflection, I felt the need for more spiritual strength and I reached for my Bible, at, which was at the bedstead, and casually thumbed through it, stopping at the book of Job, and started to read. Preoccupied at first and then studying more and more intently because of my searching questions being answered, I continued to read. The book of Job is a profound poem. To some it is hard to understand. It outlines the challenges of life. Job was a good man almost perfect. One day Satan appeared before God to tell him that he'd been going to and fro among the earth 
and told uh, God of the sinful ways of his children on earth. God said to Satan, did you notice my uh, servant Job? There's no one on earth quite like him, a perfect man, an upright man, who never sins. Then Job was tested similar to the ways we'll be tested. I see three major areas of Job's test. First, there was physical possessions. A house, cattle, children and servants came and say, I only am here left to tell thee. And then they would describe a scene where marauders had come, or a wind had come out of the and had destroyed the house where his children lived. We will all have to face physical possessions and tests in that area. Second, physical health, covered with boils from head to foot, in so much pain that Job, as his friends came to talk to him and tried to tell him that he was being punished for wrongs which he had done. Then third came mental depression, mental health, where Job was so depressed he said, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I was born? I should have slept, then had I been at rest, so that my soul chew the strangling and death rather than my life. Job was depressed. And yet, incurring the false accusations from friends who told him he must deserve the pain and tribulations as God's punishment for his sins, Job's wife urged him to curse God, even if it meant that he might be struck dead. But Job did not let these events destroy his testimony. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And that's one of the great tributes, I think, to this particular story and lesson to us. As I studied in the hotel room, I found the key of enduring the trials and tribulations of this life are not to place blame on God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. Our trials and tribulations must be used to strengthen our faith. As Job testified, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold. He had a testimony that he would come into the presence of his father and indeed was able to speak with him during this time of tribulation. Elder Orson F. Whitney wrote, No pain that we suffer, no trial that we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education, to the development of such qualities as patience, faith, fortitude, and humility. All that we suffer and all that we endure, especially when we endure it patiently, builds up our characters, purifies our hearts, expands our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable, more worthy to be called the children of God. And it is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation, that we gain the education that we come here to acquire and which will make us more like our father and mother in heaven. Being human, we would expel from our lives physical pain and mental anguish and ensure ourselves continual ease and comfort. But if we were to close the doors upon sorrow and distress, we might be excluding our greatest friends and benefactors. Suffering can make saints out of people as they learn patience of long-suffering and self-mastery. After a few hours, my sweetheart was returned to the hospital recovery room our crisis, now a learning experience. I've often pondered what I would have done if she had departed this frail existence to leave me alone in this cold and dreary world without her love. What are you going to do when you're faced with tragedy? Can you prepare yourself and learn from Job too? What is the real meaning of, if you are prepared, ye shall not fear? What preparations must you make in order to be comforted in times of trials and tribulations. None of us are going to leave this mortal probation without such experiences. That's why we came here. We must learn to trust in the Lord with all thine heart, as it says in Proverbs, and peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid, as quoted in John. The Savior is the Prince of Peace. What beautiful words of hope, comfort, and peace. 
in the hymn How Firm a Foundation It Teaches Us in Every Condition, in Sickness and Health, in Poverty's Veil, or Abounding in Wealth, at home or abroad, on land or on sea, as thy days may demand, so thy succor shall be. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the waters of sorrow shall not thee o'erflow. For I will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I cannot, desert to his foes. That soul through all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. I am touched this evening to have in attendance a father of seven children whose sweetheart passed through the veil suddenly a few weeks ago. Sweet Linda, 32 years of age. Just imagine that for most of you that may be 10 years from now. Seven children, a devoted daughter, wife, mother, taken home to Father in heaven for some inexplicable reason. The funeral was beautiful, as Linda's husband, daughter, and parents spoke of her love and talents. No one charged God foolishly. The testimonies and examples were powerful and strengthened our faith. I don't know of another place in this world except through the gospel of Jesus Christ, as taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where such strength could be given in such circumstances. Elder Ashton, on one occasion, said, individually we should thank God for the examples of those about us who battle and conquer daily challenges that are intense, real, and continuing. There are some persons who in our human eyes seem to have more than their share of trouble, as we measure it, but with God's help they are made special. They will not break. They will not yield. Now we find many people critical when a righteous person is killed, a young father or mother is taken from a family, or when violent deaths occur. Some become bitter when oft-repeated prayers seem unanswered. Some lose faith and turn sour when solemn administrations by holy men seem to be ignored, and no restoration seems to come from repeated prayer circles. But if all the sick were healed, if all the righteous were protected and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of our Father and this eternal plan of progression would be annulled, and a basic principle of the gospel, free agency, would be ended. He that is faithful in tribulation, the reward of the same is greater in the kingdom of heaven. You cannot behold with your natural eyes from the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. In the Doctrine and Covenants in two places it says, For after much tribulation come the blessings. If we say that early death is a calamity, disaster, or tragedy, would it not be saying that mortality is preferable to earlier entrance into the spirit of the world and the eventual salvation and exaltation? If mortality be the perfect state, then death would be a frustration. But the Gospel teaches us that no tragedy, there is no tragedy in death, especially if we die in faith. In the Doctrine and Covenants it says, He that hath faith in me to be healed, and is not appointed to death, shall be healed. Are we ones to judge who is appointed to death? That is for Father and for his Son, Jesus Christ. Apparently the Lord did not consider death always a curse or tragedy, for he said, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Life goes on and free agency continues, and death which seems a calamity is part of eternal blessings. I am grateful that even th through the priesthood, President Kimball said on one occasion, I cannot heal all the sick. I might heal people who should die. I might relieve people of suffering who should suffer. I fear I would frustrate the purposes of God. On another occasion, I remember when President Kimball, at the passing of his dear friend, President Marion Romney, 
when, his, when President Romney's wife died, President Kimball said, it is a good thing that I do not hold the key of resurrection because of his great feeling for the sorrow and loneliness of his dear friend, President Romney. Suffering can make saints of people as they learn patient, long-suffering, and self-mastery, we're told. The suffering of the Savior was part of his education. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by those things which he suffered, it says in Hebrews, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that would obey him. Again, the Savior has promised that to worthy members that the Holy Ghost would be a comforter in times of sickness and death. Many have borne witness of the comforting spirit that has attended them in times of sorrow, helping them to find peace and understanding. A few weeks ago, it was my privilege to meet two beautiful close friends. This is a story told more than 10 years ago by Elder Franklin D. Richards. He said, I met these two close friends who had lost their husbands in a tragic airplane accident. Did I find them in despair and deep mourning? No, indeed. I have never witnessed greater courage and strength. They both bore witness to the fact that they had truly felt the comfort of the Spirit, that they knew that there was a purpose in the call that had been given to their husbands, that they had assurance that all would be well with them and their families as they lived close to the Church and kept the commandments of the Lord. Could the Lord have prevented those tragedies? The answer is yes. On another occasion, President Kimball said, The Lord is omnipotent. With all power to control our lives, save us pain, prevent all accidents, drive all planes and cars, feed us, protect us, save us from labor, save us from effort, sickness, even death. But is that what you want? Would you shield your children from effort, from disappointments, temptations, sorrows, and sufferings? The basic gospel law is free agency. To force us to be careful or righteous would be to nullify that fundamental law, and growth would be impossible. In the scriptures it says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then the Savior said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Holy Ghost is the Comforter. This name title is given to the third member of the Godhead to signify his mission, the bringing of solace, love, peace, quiet enjoyment and comfort to the saints. Scriptures setting forth the con consolation and encouragement which spring up in the hearts of righteous by the power of the Holy Ghost frequently speak of him as the Comforter. Moroni, writing of the visitation of the Holy Ghost, says that this Comforter filleth with hope and perfect love. And in 1 John we learn that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. If we truly love the Savior, we will not fear. Many of us in attendance tonight may face similar tests of faith in the future. Will we be prepared? What will be your response? There are many ways we may be tested. The death of a loved one, the birth defect of a child, an accident paralyzing a loved one, our own illness, failure to reach a goal in life, the missing out of a sweetheart, which you would like to have to be your eternal companion, to one of your friends. <laughs> the only thing I can say on that is, when the girl you love most gets married in the temple, be there. <laughs> and not as a witness. <laughs> being single and lonely, being married and experienced divorce, and when maybe a close friend has betrayed a trust. Leo Tolstoy's story of Martin Avdich I picked out of a shelf last December at Christmas time, happening to read a book of Leo Tolstoy's collections. It tells a beautiful lesson on how to deal with sorrow in our life. Martin had experienced a great deal of tragedy in his life. His two oldest children had passed away. Later, his wife became ill and died, leaving Martin alone with his little son, Kapitoska, the only bright spot remaining in his life. Then Tapakoshka suddenly became ill with a high fever and died within a few days. Martin was devastated and had a hard time dealing with the sorrow and tragedies he had encountered. One day, an old man came to Martin's shop and convinced him that he must pull himself out of his depression and sorrow. He told him that he first must get a copy of the New Testament 
and study it. Then he said that he must turn his thoughts away from himself and attend to the needs of others. Martin took the old man's advice and immediately went out and bought a copy of the New Testament. He found it fascinating, so much so that he often read it until the oil burned in his light, in his lamp late into the night. One evening he pondered over the message found in Luke 7, beginning with verse 4. As he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and they gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I have come has, ceased, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. As he thought about how he had treated others, Martin fell asleep. He was awakened by a voice telling him that the Savior was coming to visit him the next day. When morning came, Martin arose early and started his work. He watched out the window of his shop as people passed. While he was working and watching, he noticed an old soldier who had been hired to clean the snow away. The old soldier looked tired and cold, and Martin tapped on the window and motioned him to come in. The old man was nearly frozen. Martin offered him hot food and shelter to warm himself. He also shared with him his feeling about the happiness reading the Holy Scriptures had brought into his life. After the old soldier had left, Martin once again set about his work in his shoemaking shop. He continued to look out the window for his guest. He soon noticed a young woman who stopped outside his shop to try to bundle a tiny baby to protect the child from the cold. She was poorly dressed from the extreme cold outside and had very little protection for the child. Martin invited her in. He gave her warm soup and also an old coat for herself and clothing for the babe and enough money to buy a new one. Both mother and baby were warm and protected from the cold when they left on their journey. Martin cleaned the dishes and went back to work near the window of his shoemaking shop. It wasn't long before he saw an old woman who had been selling apples. As she set her basket of apples down to adjust a large, awkward sack she was packing, a young boy came by and grabbed an apple. The old woman, who'd become wary and on guard from years of experience, grabbed the boy by the scruff of the neck. As the two were struggling, Martin dashed out to help. Through his efforts, not only did the old woman and the boy stop their fighting, but by the time they left his shop, the boy offered to carry the large sack for the old late to the old lady's home, and she rewarded him with a big red apple. They walked together down the street, talking and laughing as they went. Martin went inside. It was getting late, so he cleaned his shop and put his tools away. He had still not had his expected guest. The thought he saw, then he thought he saw sh shadows in the dark corner of the room, but decided that the dim light it was playing tricks on him. He opened the New Testament and began to read, pondering why his guest had not arrived. Suddenly he heard a voice call out his name, saying, Martin, Martin, dost thou not know me? Who art thou? said Avdich. Even I whispered the voice again, and out from the dark corner stepped the old soldier. He smiled at Martin and then was gone. It is I, whispered a second voice and a young woman and child stepped out from the dark corner of the room. She and the baby smiled and were gone. They had disappeared. It is I, said a third voice, and an old lady and the boy with his apple stepped out and smiled and were gone. Martin rubbed his eyes, looked down at where his New Testament had fallen open, and it read, For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. In this room this evening, there are many strangers who need to be taken in. It is hard to realize that there are many who are alone who are sitting in this vast audience, but they do need friends, and they do need to be taken in. And further down the page he read, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brother, ye have done it unto me. Then Martin Avdich understood that the vision had come true in his Savior, in very truth had visited him that day, and he had received him. 
This story outlines the important way to prepare ourselves to meet a tragedy by reading the scriptures, to strengthen ourselves, by turning our thoughts away from ourselves, and attending to the needs of others. Another beautiful example is found in the life of Thomas More. Why do so many of us want to go it alone when things get difficult and deny those who love us most the joy and blessings which come from sharing? The principle helping one in need is well expressed in the touching love story of Thomas More. I'll be honest with you, it's a love story to my wife. A famous 19th century Irish poet, Thomas More returned from a business trip and found his wife had locked herself in an upstairs bedroom and had asked to see no one. More learned the terrible truth that his beautiful wife had contacted smallpox and her milk milky complexion was now pocked and scarred. She had looked at herself in the mirror and demanded that the shutters be drawn, never to be open again. She never wanted to see her husband again. He did, she did not want him to see her in her affliction. Thomas More did not listen. He went upstairs to the darkened room and started to light a lamp. His wife pleaded with him to remain in darkness alone. She felt it best not to subject her husband to seeing a loved one marred. She asked him to go. Martin did go. He went downstairs and spent the rest of the night in prayerful writing. He'd never written a song before, but that night he wrote not only the words but the music to a song that we all know. He returned to his wife's darkened room. Are you awake, he asked. Yes, she said, but you must not see me. Please don't press me, Thomas. I'll sing to you then, he said. And Thomas More sang the song that still lives today. Believe me, if all those enduring young charms which I gaze on so fondly today were to change by tomorrow and fleet in my arms like fairy gifts fading away, thou wouldst still be adored at this moment thou art. More heard a movement in the room where his wife had lain in loneliness, he continued, let thy lovingness fade as it will. And around the dear ruin, each wish of my heart would entwine itself verdantly still. The song ended as his voice faded. Moore heard his bride arise. She crossed the room to the window, reached up and slowly withdrew the shutters, opened the curtain and let in the morning light. I would hope we'd have that experience just once in our life with a friend or a loved one. I would like at this time to thank my wife for opening up the shutters of my life and letting in her light and her life and sharing it with me for over 30 years. I would not be here today without her love and companionship. When we are marred spiritually or physically, our first reaction is to withdraw to the dark shadows of depression, to blot out hope and joy. The light of life which comes from knowing we are living the commandments of our Father in heaven, and that indeed peace can be ours. This withdrawal will ultimately lead us to rebellion against those who would like to be our friends, those who can help us most, even our family. But worst of all, we finally reject ourselves. Those who are alone and lonely should not retreat to the sanctuary of their private thoughts and chambers. Such retreat will ultimately lead them into the darkening influence of the adversary, which leads to despondency, loneliness, frustration, and to thinking of themselves worthless. After one thinks of himself as worthless, he then oftentimes turns to associates who corrode those delicate spiritual contacts, rendering their spiritual receiving antennas and transmitters useless. What good is it to associate with and ask advice of someone who has disoriented himself and only tells us what we want to hear? Isn't it better to turn to a loving parent, a friend, a trusted advisor who can help us reach for and attain celestial goals? Having almost lost my companion a decade ago, I determined not to have any regrets in our relationship in the remaining years we had together. Whittier wrote of Maud Muller, for all of sad words of tongue and pen, 
the saddest of these, it might have been. I hope that you will not have it, it might have been's in your life. One of the great tragedies in our lives is to look back and say, but for my actions, this might have been. Mildred Pettit, who wrote the words to I am a child of God, wrote a poem called Regrets, My Regrets. And this is how it goes. Are not, f are not for things, excuse me, she says, my regrets are not for things I've done, but for the things I meant to do. The violets I picked and failed to send. Words of love I did not give a friend. The call I should have made at sorrow's door. Comforts that I could have sent the poor. The letter that somehow I did not pen. Chances lost will never come again. These are my regrets. And then from another book, from Stephen Gurley, it's a, he said on one occasion, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. It has been said that each of us has enough strength to endure another's tragedies, tribulations, and sorrows. If you'll think about that, realize that after a funeral, how many days does it take until you're totally consumed? with those cares of your life and may have forgotten someone that you should call or think about who is suffering. We all know that in this mortal probation we must prepare for tragedies and that directly affect our lives, and I'd like to list five ways. First, by having a deep, abiding faith in God our Father and in our Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in their mercy and doing all that we can, and as Job not to charge God foolishly. Second, by being spiritually strong, by being obedient and having the Holy Ghost to guide us, to comfort us, bring peace to our souls. This would include regular prayer and study of the scriptures as individuals, with our companions, and with our families. Third, by acquiring personal accountability for our actions not blaming others for our mistakes, failures, opposition, or unexplained trials. Hopefully walking the gospel road less traveled means we can look back without regrets for our actions. Living gospel principles may bring loneliness in terms of our todays and tomorrows, but it can reward us with eternal blessings. Fourth, we need to reach out to those who have experienced a tragedy in their lives in this way, we learn from their example of faith and strength. Also, we learn we must reach out and help when we are hurting in the same way the Savior thought of his mother's care in the closing moments in Calgary. Fifth, the last point of meeting adversity, adversity in our lives comes from a book I read recently, actually two books, one by Viktor Frankl, author of Man's Search for Meaning. He related his experience in surviving two concentration camp experiences, where all vestiges of human rights were taken from the inmates. Frankl is fond of quoting Nitschke, which says, He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are so fortunate to have the why we are here and where we are going, we can endure almost any how. In the concentration camp, every circumstance conspires to make the prisoners lose hold of their purpose of life. All reasons for living are taken away through beatings, fear, poor nutrition, captors, and mental mind games. What alone remains, Frankel said, the last of human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in a given set of circumstances. What a joy it would be if we would not let others determine how we were going to act to a circumstance. The prisoners were all average men, but some at least, by choosing to be worthy of their suffering, proved by serving all against unsurmountable odds, man's capacity to rise above our outward fates, whether they are deserved or undeserved, explained or unexplained, just or unjust, or from sources unknown, good or evil. 
In the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, one of the concluding remarks is by Harold Kushner. In the final analysis, the question of why bad things happen to good people translates itself into some very different questions, no longer asking why something happened, but asking how will we respond, what we intend to do about it now that the tragic event has happened. Are you capable of forgiving and accepting in love a world which has disappointed you because it isn't perfect, a world which there is so much unfairness and cruelty, disease, poverty, crime, earthquake, flood, and accident? Can you forgive the world's imperfections and love life because it's capable of containing great beauty and goodness and moments that are literally heaven on earth and because it's the only world we have? Are you capable of forgiving and loving the people around you, even if they have hurt you at times and let you down for not being perfect? Can you forgive them and love them because they aren't, there aren't any perfect around, except you and I, and I'm not too sure about you? <laughs> and because the penalty for being able to love imperfect people is condemning oneself to loneliness, are you capable of forgiving and loving God even when you have found that his world is not perfect and free from pain and travail, but understand it is for our growth in this mortal probation? It is our test on how we will react. Can you learn to love and forgive him as Job did despite the tests of our faith? He asks us endure to the end and return back into his presence. The capability through repentance to forgive and the ability to love God are God-given gifts to enable you and I to return with our families back into the presence of our Heavenly Father. If you can apply these preparations to meet life's challenges to tragedies, our yesterdays will seem less painful and you will not be afraid of your tomorrows. In closing, may I give you my testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and of the Holy Ghost, who bears witness of God the Father and Jesus Christ, so that we might have the strength to endure to the end. I testify you, to you that if we will put our trust in the Lord in all our doing, that we can live obediently, that we might have that comforting spirit to be with us, and indeed be able to abide in the presence of God the Father and Jesus Christ for the eternities. I close with a song I know that my Redeemer lives. Hopefully the words of this song as you listen after this discussion will be more meaningful. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives. He lives who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living head. He lives to bless me with his love. He lives to plead for me above. He lives my hungry soul to feed. He lives to bless in time of need. He lives to grant me rich supply. He lives to guide me with his eye. He lives to comfort me when faint. He lives to hear my soul's complaint. He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. He lives, my kind, wise, heavenly friend. He lives and loves me to the end. He lives, and while he lives, I'll sing. He lives, my prophet, priest, and king. He lives and grants me daily breath. He lives, and I shall conquer death. He lives, my mansion to prepare. He lives to bring me safely there. He lives all glory to his name. He lives my Savior, still the same. Oh, sweet, the joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. He lives all glory to his name. He lives my Savior, still the same. Oh, sweet, the joy this sentence gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. May the comforting faith of the fact that the Savior lives the Prince of Peace, that we might have peace and joy in our lives and endure to the end and return back into his presence and in the presence of God the Father to live for all the eternities is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.